الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم ما بعد uh, First of all I'd like to apologize for my lateness I was on my way here and I realized in packing the children I forgot the laptop so I had to go back and get it because I, uh, I didn't want to miss out on anything that I've put in my notes at least uh, that I intended to share with all of you inshallah uh, ta'ala First and foremost I'd like to share with you that what I'm presenting here are my own thoughts and they're not necessarily uh, absolute in any way uh, the the purpose the primary intent of this discussion is to actually um, facilitate food for thought so all of us are thinking inshallah ta'ala about certain issues and perhaps if we think about them uh, sincerely and together uh, hopefully we'll come to certain kinds of solutions and, and uh, you know uh, address certain challenges that the Muslims are facing um, so again, I don't claim to have the answers to the problems, but certainly I'd like to highlight some areas of problems. And as many of you know, this uh, session is dedicated to understanding some of the challenges that the Ummah is facing, especially the Ummah living here in the United States in the West. Um, and some of the, uh, what, what are some of the things we can do to try and address those problems? This is a very rhetorical, uh, almost slogan type of statement. What is the problem of the Ummah? Right, and it's uh, sometimes we actually have a, a very deep, profound answer, but the answer also seems like a slogan. Well, the problem of the ummah is a lack of iman. If we really had iman, then we would be okay. And it seems like that's an oversimplification, but I'd like to start with the fact that that, in fact, is a very deep and uh, uh, profound answer to the problem of the ummah. Allah Azza wa Jal has made very categorical statements about this fact. Allah Azza wa for example, has told us in a, in a, in a context in Surah Ali Imran where Muslims are suffering defeat, He's told us, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ don't be, don't be grieved, you know, don't be weakened, don't be grieved, don't be sad. You are going to be the, the ones who are supreme. You're going to be the highest ones if in fact you are true believers. If in fact you truly have Iman. So the acquisition of Iman has something to do with the Muslims being supreme. Or them not being in a situation of humiliation uh, and weakness. And of course when Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the kinds of humiliation that the Bani Israel suffered. You know, they were also a nation that could have, you know, had they wanted, Allah would have sent blessings upon them from the sky. And Allah talks about that in the Quran. But then what, what does Allah address as their problem? He says, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Your hearts became hard. The hearts were empty of Iman. The Iman was not there. Similarly, you know, you, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard this phrase before that the, you know, it seems like the Ummah is dead. Or the spirit of the Ummah is dead, or it's like it's sleeping and things like that. And Allah Azza wa Jal, interestingly in the Quran, compares people whose Iman is empty to people who are actually dead. And He compares people whose Iman, his, whose faith has come back to life, to like plants that come out of the dead earth. You know? So Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, in Surah Al Hadid, He says, فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ You know, people of the book before us. Their hearts became hard and most of them are corrupt. That's what he makes a statement about them. And then he says, You should know Allah gives life to the earth after it had died. In other words, first he talked about the hearts being hard. And all of a sudden he says, you should know by the way, Allah can bring the earth back to life. In other words, you should know your hearts can also be brought back to life. The iman in your hearts can be revived as well. But though this is a deep response, Sometimes we don't look at it in a deep way. When we say that the problem of our ummah is a lack of iman, we don't really address that problem in a, in a meaningful, in a deep enough way. That's at least my thought on it. And so what I want to share with you is that this, this idea of reviving the iman, the faith of the ummah, you can at least, at the very least, divide it into three things. This is a spiritual problem, which is I think most people understand. When you say it's a problem of the heart, it's a spiritual problem. The second thing is that it's an intellectual problem. And a lot of people don't give that much attention. Iman is not just a spiritual thing, it is also an 
intellectual thing. It's something that we are convinced of intellectually as well. And finally, as a result of both of those things, this is a moral problem. In other words, when, when someone actually benefits from the fruits of Iman, then what comes out of them is this high standard of morality and ethics. Right? They, they become a person of high character. Right? So when Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, talks about people of, of Iman, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ He mentions very high ethical characteristics of them. You know? So these three things, a spiritual problem, an intellectual problem, and then a moral problem. The one that gets the least attention, at least as far as I've seen, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is the intellectual problem. Well, though we have to address all three of them. It, for for uh, purposes of this discussion, what I'd like to say is that our, the, the, human, the personality of the human being, the way we make decisions, Allah Azza wa has divided it into two faculties. And both of these faculties are talked about in the Qur'an. Though as far as psychology is concerned, there are even more faculties. These are the two I'm going to highlight before you today. There's the heart and there's the mind. So Allah Azza wa challenges the mind of the people and He says, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَفَلَا تَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ Right? You know, وَهُمْ يَشْعُرُونَ يَعْرِفُونَ These words are used for the intellect. To understand, to think deeply, to, to, to reflect, to ponder. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Don't they reflect deeply on the Qur'an? These are intellectual kinds of exercises. But at the same time, Allah Azza wa talks about the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, the taqwa of Allah, the iman in Allah, removing doubts, and all of these matters as the Qur'an talks about them are matters of the heart. So you've got two things to worry about. You've got the heart to worry about and the mind to worry about as far as Allah Azza wa Jal in the Qur'an is concerned. Now, again, just putting, laying the foundation for what is going to be inshallah a long discussion, the, the, one of the founding things I want to share with you is that the, the Christian community, as described in the Qur'an, were people that had very soft hearts. These were people that, you know, uh, remember Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how they are, they are people of uh, soft hearts. And at the same time, what they abandoned was the intellectual dimension. Three, three is one and one is three didn't have to make sense. Why? Because their spirituality was so important, they kind of denied the idea of having to think about their faith. So even to this day, you can have the smartest, very intelligent Christians who believe in the Trinity, very intelligent, they can have PhDs in sciences and things like that, but when you talk to them about the Trinity or you talk to them about Jesus, you know, His blood saving you from all sins and things like that, which makes absolutely no sense from a logical point of view, they'll just say it's the mystery of faith. In other words, they, when it comes to certain things, they want to shut their mind off. The exact opposite extreme Allah describes was the Bani Israel. Their hearts became hard, but their minds are very sharp. So they're very intelligent people. They, when they saw the Messenger of Allah وسلم, they immediately recognized him. This is the one being described in our books. All of the signs that we have studied in our books point to the fact that this is the Messenger of Allah. Now that takes a very intelligent person to figure out. So Allah is actually acknowledging that these people are pretty intelligent. But where's the problem though? When this is good, this is bad. So for the Christian community, this is good, and this isn't being applied. And for the, for the Bani Israel in Qur'an, this is being applied, but this has gone bad. You understand? Now this ummah is supposed to be the ummah of balance. So what is supposed to be sound when it comes to us? Our hearts and our minds. Right? These are not rhetorical statements. These are very powerful uh, 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 declarations. Now. What I want to share with you about the intellectual, I'll move along quickly inshaAllah ta'ala, is that we are living in times where the, fun, the foundation of Islam is under attack. And Islam is only the most recent victim of a larger attack. The larger attack is against this idea of faith and religion altogether. Religion is something for stupid people. It's, it's something for pre-modern people. Now that we are living in the scientific age, in the age of open-mindedness, in enlightenment, we can understand that religion was only developed by older societies to help control the masses and to help keep society organized and keep people from doing crimes. Because you can't stop them from doing crimes because of the fear of police or this or that. But if you instill in them the fear of a divine being, whether that divine being is the sun god or it's, the, it's this tree that you worship or it's the clouds 
or whatever, or it's one God in the end, but we're going to instill a fear of a God in people so we can organize society and control them. So modern philosophers started looking at religion as a means of just controlling people, and it's you know uh, one of the, uh, the, the more recent expressions in philosophy, religion is the opiate of the masses, right? That religion is kind of like a drug. You get high off of it and you can be controlled, masses can be controlled. So a pastor or an imam or a rabbi can speak before a crowd of a thousand or thousands and they will all listen intently, right? So they're all basically drugged, right? They're all drugged. So they look at religion as this inferior thing. Now, of course, because Islam is the most recent victim, because they've been bashing Christianity far before Islam. If you're worried that they don't bash Christianity, think again. Christianity has been under atta intellectual attack for well over a couple of centuries now. Right? Its, its foundations have been crushed. It's an object of ridicule. But now, it's Islam's turn. So what I'm trying to get at is the foundations of Islam. The fact that, that we believe Muhammad wasallam is a messenger. The fact that we believe in one God, one ilah. These fundamentals are being questioned. Why do you believe in God anyway? What makes you think he's a messenger? Oh, your book is full of contradictions. Look at this, this, this that you said. What about this hadith? What about that? What about the other? And on top of this, what's happening is, if, if you didn't already know this, Islam has been studied in the West for the last three to four hundred years. They've been studying Islam. And they've been studying Islam not for the purpose of understanding it, but for the purpose of, it originally started in the Catholic Church, where the, the studies began in order to become better pastors, or, or better, better ministers of Christianity when they go to the Muslim world, and they preach to the Africans and the Asians, and you know, Muslims that are in certain parts of Europe. We should know their book so we can show them how flawed it is, so we can call them to Christianity. So th this was actually even started about 400 years ago. If you look at the encyclopedia of Christian studies, you know, from like 350, 400 years ago, you'll find entries about Muslims. And the thing they'll say about Muslims is, hey, when you talk to a Muslim, just tell them about these contradictions. They've already got those listed, you know. But now it's evolved. Now you have people that are doing PhD studies on one hadith. This person will spend like six to eight years studying one hadith with the entire chain of narration and every person who's mentioned in the chain of... And this is non-Muslim. This is a non-Muslim. And why, so why are they studying this? You have to understand why. You know when people accept a religion, they don't necessarily do the deepest amount of research to accept that religion. They don't, most people accept a religion for moral reasons, spiritual reasons, and to, some, to their level of understanding, they're convinced, so they accept. But there's always a fear that enough people will accept a religion that it might become a dominant force in any society. That's a danger. To prevent it ever from becoming a dominant force, if it gets to a certain level, we should have our attacks against that religion ready, so when they get to that level, we can crush them. Not crush them with military might, not crush them with, you know, uh, propaganda. This is child's play. The kinds of propaganda you see in the media, that's child's play. You can, even, even a, a, a well, a, a soundly knowledgeable Muslim teenager can tell that this guy talking about the Qur'an or the seerah or the, or the, or the Messenger of Allah sallallahu this guy's an idiot, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, the kinds of attacks that we see in the media are childish really. But the real attacks, they're holding them back. Because they've been engaged in this deep study of Islam for some time. And so when you get into, for example, I, I know brothers that, uh, you know, their intention was they're going to study Islam in the Muslim world, and then they're going to come here and they're going to do PhDs in Islamic studies in different universities, things like that. And they got into the, you know, one such program, for example, I have a friend who's in Harvard at the Islamic studies program. And I met him, in, he was getting his master's, then he was going to get into his PhD, again, Islamic studies. He's not even done with his master's, I was just, I went to Boston and I was hanging out with him, and what, is, what does he tell me? He says, man, after the two semesters, I lost my faith. And the only way I can actually continue my studies is that I, I stop thinking about it. Because if I think about it, I can't, I can't keep my iman anymore. It's gone. And so, he, you know, because you know what they do, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the level of planning. The, the first semester he attended was, it's called Ilm uh, al-Hadith, Science of Hadith, right? And you know what the premise is? For the last 80 years in American academics, when, pe when they study hadith, you know how we say how authentic a hadith is? 
you know, muttafaqun uh, alayhi, the strong chain of narration, tawatur, things like that. It occurs in Bukhari and Muslim, you know. So the stronger the chain is, the more authentic, the more reliable the hadith is. They reverse engineered it. They presented a theory where the stronger the narration, that means the more these Muslims had to come up with um, sort of a fabricated list to make sure the Muslims followed these texts. In other words, the more, the stronger the chain of narration, the more suspect the text. That's what they begin with. And they'll have research and papers and articles and discussions on this stuff to the nth degree. And if you don't know your stuff, you're going to get swept away in no time. And you know, th this isn't a PhD program. Let's come to at least all of our youth eventually are going to go, I would think, into a bachelor's program at the very least. An associate's bachelor's program. Now there's Islam 101 or philosophy 101 or the philosophy of ethics. In Islam 101, you can get your faith rattled. I took an Islamic studies class when I was in college. And the questions they asked, I used to, I, the, they would ask us, the Muslim kids questions. I would go to the Imam and ask them questions and the Imam would just say, Astaghfirullah, make, make dua. You know? Because this is waswasa of shaitan. He's, he's putting doubt in your mind. I was like, dude, this is my professor, not shaitan. I mean, he may be, but I'm saying. <laughs> What we need to have, so, so the, this is my first major point. When we say that the problem of the Ummah is Iman, then protecting the intellectual integrity of Iman is critical. The things that they're trying to attack, they're not trying to attack the top of the building, they're trying to attack, attack what? The foundation. When the foundation is gone, you don't have to worry about the rest of the building, it's all gone. Right? Our, enti our entire Islam is built upon this faith. When you take that faith away, there's nothing left. So we have to, the first thing, first order of business, is that we actually have to guard, and strengthen, and fortify this foundation. Not just from a, a spiritual point of view, but also from an intellectual point of view. Let, let me speak to you in practical terms. In Islamic school, in Sunday school, in a halaqa at the masjid, you can learn about Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, right? Uluhiyyah. Al-Asma wa Sifat. You can learn about those things. You can read a book on Aqidah. You can learn about Tawheed. You can learn about Akhirah. You can learn about Risala. But you know what we have to study in Aqidah now? We have to study, you know, uh, anthropology. We have to study Darwinism. We have to study Richard Dawkins, the leading atheist in the world. Who is, who, whose studies against belief in God are now being studied at the highest levels in universities. And one of Muslim, I've met Muslim kids who have left Islam over the last summer. It's been very depressing for me. You know, I've been traveling all over teaching Arabic studies and I've met kids who memorized Quran and then left the deen. Why? Because they read Richard Dawkins. They read this, this philosopher who talks about, athe you know how we say when human beings are born, they're born on the fitrah. In other words, we have Iman in Allah as the default. The techies here know what default is, right? Dot .php or whatever, right? So the default condition is belief in God. Richard Dawkins, argue, Dawkins argues the default position is atheism. We are taught belief in God. So if you want to go back to the natural state, you'll go back to atheism, right? And I'm oversimplifying his arguments, they have swept the world by storm. When our kids go, and go into a medical program, they are going to study evolution, aren't they? They're going to study it. Doesn't matter how long their beards are, how many surahs they memorize, they're going to study evolution. And when they study it, and they're going to, they're going to learn certain things that contradict what they know to be their faith, they're going to say, I, I, just, I just shouldn't think about it. So they develop a dual personality, right? And this duality is the signature personality of the Christian mind. For the Christian mind, even if my faith makes no sense, I'm still going to believe, right? It doesn't have to make sense. But this is not Islam. Islam has to make sense. I call to Allah with eyes open, with insight. In other words, we don't, there's, for us, there's no such thing as blind faith. We're supposed to be convinced of this deen, so much so, that Allah's Messenger وسلم, is commanded to tell who, people who don't believe, He's commanded, go ahead and bring your proofs against me. Hatu burhanakum. Bring your proofs. So when they bring forward atheism and agnosticism, and when they bring forward anthropology, and they bring forward evolution, and things like that, that seem at the surface level to contradict our faith, they are doing what Allah told them to do. Allah told them to bring evidences against our deen. That's what Allah told them. The problem though is, if we don't know our deen, then we're not ready to respond. Don't think Qur'an is not strong enough to respond to those things. We haven't studied it deep enough to respond, is what the problem is. So this intellectual problem is something that is very serious, and we haven't even begun to address it. 
We haven't begun to address it. And so that's the first problem I want to bring to your attention. The second thing is, the life of a community is also tied directly to Iman. We can't deny that Allah made that, uh, like I said, Allah already declared that for us in, in His book. But I want to tell you that there are four fundamentals, and you probably heard this tons and tons of times before, but I, hope, I would think not in this regard, not in the way I'm about to present to you. There are four fundamentals that if we implemented them properly, the, and if we, we had a relationship with them properly, our communities would be rock solid. And again, I'm not even talking about higher things yet, I'm talking about fundamentals. What's the first fundamental? It is the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an. In other words, the Muslims have to have a sound, working relationship with the Qur'an. Not only are they reciting it, not only are they memorizing it, not only are they loving the recitation of it, and loving to memorize it, and loving to study it, and learn its tajweed properly, they're also understanding it in a deep and meaningful way. And they're continually growing in their understanding of this book. You know, Qur'an is an incredible book. Usually when people study religion, they become more strict and close-minded. The Qur'an is incredible. The more you study it, the more open-minded you become. The more it opens your mind. The more it makes you think about things differently. Right? It's a means by which you can become more intellectual. You can become at the same time more spiritual, at the same time more intellectual. No other book does this except Qur'an. There are books that will push spirituality down your throat, and there are books that will be entirely philosophical and intellectual. The Qur'an is incredibly spiritual and incredibly philosophical, not just philosophical, but really uh, deep and intellectual at the same time. The first thing that has to happen for men, women, and children across the board in every Muslim community is a comprehensive Qur'anic education. From the basics to this idea of engaging in pondering and reflection on the Qur'an. You know, really engaging the text and really appreciating what Allah Azza wa has to say to the best of our ability. That should be a communal exercise. And it needs to be facilitated. You know, Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, as his, in his position as Amir al-Mu'mineen, one of the first orders of business is halaqat of Qur'an. Halaqat of Qur'an, all over. And Sahaba are sitting and they're studying Qur'an together. Right? Because this has to do with us keeping our identity intact. That's the first thing. That's the first fundamental. The second fundamental is Salat. And when I say so, you've heard about the importance of Salat tons of times. So I'm not going to repeat what you've already heard hundreds of times. But I will tie it to what I'm trying to say here. When you have a healthy relationship with the Qur'an, you know how even the most highest professions like physicians or architects or whatever, even they have to go for refresher seminars and reviews, right? You're, you've internalized this really deep, profound thing. Where do you get your review? Salat. Every few hours you stand in front of Allah and you review what message He's given you, the profound words that He's given you and me. So it's an opportunity for us to refresh our faith constantly. It, it revives us spiritually and intellectually every single time, if we are able to engage in our salat. But if our salat is what it is right now, which is pretty much very good cardiovascular exercise, right? And it's not much more than that for most of us. We don't know what's being recited. We don't know what Allah Azza wa is saying in the Qur'an. Now this is a tragedy. Because the means by which you can keep Qur'an alive in the community, Allah gave us that mechanism, that institution is salah. When the salah becomes, when the salah is not connecting you to Qur'an, nothing can connect you to the Qur'an. Because salah is what Allah gave us to connect to the Qur'an. That's what Allah gave us. What can we have in addition that's gonna work? So we have the halaqat and the tafasir and things like that, but there needs to be a mass movement of facilitating Arabic education, for Muslims across the world, and I'm just saying specifically here in the United States, we should have access to the best form of Arabic education for the purpose of us having a better sound experience in Salat. This has to do with us surviving. Because when our Salah becomes empty, then the entire deen is gone. Because you know, Salah is directly connected to three things. I'll make quick mention of this. The first thing is the, 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 the state of the Ummah, the state of the union, right? The state of the union, Allah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, says about the salah, He says, In saluhat, saluhat amru kulluhu. If, this, if the salat is good, then the whole thing is good. If salat is good, the whole thing is good. You know, it's an amazing thing to say. It's not just about making wudu properly and facing the right direction. And those are all important peripherals. But what's the heart of the salah? To connect to the word of Allah. To have this deep relationship. With, and if that's there, then the ummah is okay. Then they're connected to what they need to be connected to. You know, their, their halaqah of Qur'an is when they stand in front of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an amazing thing. So that's the first thing. It fixes the problem of the ummah. The second thing about salah I want to mention is, you know how I said the fundamental problem of 
uh, of, of the ummah is iman. Did I say that? Right? You know, in the Quran, Allah uses when, when the qibla changed. Well, when the qibla changed, Allah Azza wa says, "Wa ma kana Allahu liyudiya imanakum." You know, the Jews came to the Muslims and they said, "You've been praying in the wrong. You had the wrong GPS address all these years. Your salat didn't count because the qibla is this one, and you've been praying towards Aqsa." You know, they said all those years got wasted, huh? And Allah says, no, Allah will not waste. He didn't say Allah will not waste your prayers. Allah says Allah is not one to waste your iman. In other words, in the ayah, what iman means is salat. To Allah Azza wa Jal, salat and iman are the same thing. So if salat is good, necessarily what does that mean? Iman is good. As far as Allah is concerned, if salat is good, iman is good. So that's the second thing. The third and final thing I want to tell you about this fundamental, which is salat, that as an institution that we need to protect and, and, and savor, is that Allah Azza wa Jal calls the entire Qur'an dhikr. Multiple times. In huwa illa dhikrun, you know, wa Qur'anun mubin, kalla innaha tadhkira wa dhakkir bil Qur'an, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, over and over again, Allah mentions that the Qur'an is reminder. But what does He say about Salat? He says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish Salat so you can remember me. So the Qur'an is remembrance and Salat, Allah also calls that remembrance. In other words, the real way to remember Allah through the Qur'an is the Salat. So Salat is our second fundamental. We have to fix it. We have to understand what's being said. And I, we have to, I, I can't just say this philosophically to you, I have to mention some practical things too. Here's the one practical step for instance. So the Imam reads Suratul Adiyat in Maghrib, right? Even if he doesn't read the, the whole one little bit of Adiyat in first rakah, a little bit in second rakah, it's a short salat. At the immediately at the end of salat, you know what we recited today? We recited these ayat and just a couple of things about those ayat. If we if we're not at the level of understanding Arabic yet, at least get something out of that salat. <laughs> what did what did Allah say to us in this salat? What did Allah say to us in this surah? Something from it. Even if a little bit, to give Muslims a taste of what they're missing. If we just had a taste of what we're missing, l being motivated to learn this book and to educate ourselves and our families about this book would become easy. Because if you just have a taste of this treasure, you become addicted, it's very easy. You don't have to force someone to want to learn the Qur'an if you've really been able to give them a taste of it. Then the rest of it they can do on their own. You know, so that's the second, the, the, the second fundamental. The first fundamental was the Qur'an, the second the Salat, the third and probably critical and tied to both of these things, what's the biggest Salat we have every week? Jum'ah. You know, Surah Al-Jum'ah is the Surah in which Allah talks about the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Surah Al-Jum'ah. And Surah Al-Jum'ah is, Jum ah is the convention of the Muslims every week. You don't have to make flyers, you don't have to pass out, you don't have to make Facebook events or send mass emails out. This Friday at 1.40 p.m. be there. You don't have to do that. And the people who come to Jum'ah are people that you will never see at any Islamic conference or any Islamic program. They're not going to be listening to lectures or talks. They could be the farthest from the religion, but where are they necessarily every week? They're at Jum'ah. No invitation necessary. Allah created this program, a weekly halaqa, that no matter how bad we get, we still attend it. We still, masses of us attend it. You know what this gives us? It gives us an opportunity that no other ummah has. We have, you know, only the devout go to church on Sunday. Only the devout. But we have even the weakest of the Muslims coming to Jum'ah on Friday. We have an opportunity to connect them to Allah's book. They've given us 20 minutes of their time. And if they're sleeping in that time, it's not their fault, it's our fault. We have to give them something that will keep them awake. But the, the Jum'ah khutbah is, is in, my, in my opinion, the biggest responsibility of a community. It's the biggest responsibility. It is the public service of a masjid. So that Jum'ah is that which connects the people to the Qur'an. It gives them something to think about. It, it addresses their problems. It convinces them that the Qur'an actually has solutions for their life. It has something to do with them. It's not just something they just do because they were doing it since they were kids. It makes them think about life differently. So Jum'ah, the, the critical and strategic importance of Jum'ah. I make a point to say that because a lot of times our Jum'ahs, and I, I don't mean to you know, self-aggrandize, some of our khatibs are awesome. But then we have khatibs that are just, in my opinion, they are a violation of the rights of the community. <laughs> you know, the community deserves to hear productive things. And if they hear things that just don't have any benefit, you know, or they have no head or no tail. They didn't, you know, they didn't produce something. Somebody just had, they were in a bad mood and they needed to vent. 
And so they decided they're going to use the podium of the khutbah event. Right? That is a violation of the right of the community. So this is an amana that needs to be protected. And finally, this is the last thing in regards to the, the basic education of a, of a community. If that is in place, it's going to be a sound community. The last piece of the puzzle in my opinion, wallahu a'lam, is a study of the seerah. Is a study of the life of the Messenger Why do I say that? Is because the Muslim will not truly feel Islam until they can relate with and fall in love with the struggles and the missions of the Messenger of Allah Until they have a deep understanding of who this man was, how he lived, what he sacrificed, what he did for you and me. And until they're reminded of his struggle and have a sound knowledge of that struggle, they're not going to be able to identify with them. You know how a good, you know, in most countries they have this uh, a curriculum where they teach the history of that country. Like in America, we have American history. You can imagine in Somalia, they'll teach Somali history. In Pakistan, they'll teach Pakistani history. In India, they'll teach Indian history, right? So when you study history, the idea is in young people, it will give them a sense of identity with that nation. They know its history, they know where they come from, they're tied to that legacy. What history gives us a sense of identity? It is the history, number one, first and foremost, of the life of Allah's Messenger That is our identity. So the, a, 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 a regular study of the Qur'an, coupled with a powerful study of the seerah of the Messenger وسلم, are absolute essentials for a community. They are absolute essentials for a community. This is the first thing I want to share with you. The rest of it, inshallah ta'ala, I'll go rather quickly. I think I might need more than one session to finish my thoughts on this stuff. But Allah, I'll, I'll probably go another 30 minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, so I talked about the, uh, uh, the, the four fundamentals, the Qur'an, Salah, Jum'ah, and Seerah, as part of an essential fundamental educational campaign. Then, as far as Qur'anic education is concerned, I want to present the idea that there are three levels of Qur'anic education and all three levels are absolutely critical. The first level is translation. In other words, a good, sound translation, not written translation, those are plenty available. I'm saying spoken translation. Right? And not even studio recording, like conversational translation, making you feel like Qur'an is a conversation between you and Allah. That kind of translation will at least connect Muslims, make them familiar with Islam. Make them familiar with the Qur'an, that's the first level. The second level is dars of the Qur'an. Meaning, you know how we do it in the evenings with Surah Al-Baqarah? A couple of lessons from every ayah, not too deep, not too much in a study, but just a few things about what the ayah says. A few lessons from it. So in other words, the Muslims are trying to engage with the text a little more than just translation. That's the second level. That needs to be there as well, it needs to be in place. And then there's the third level, which is a thorough, deep study of the ayat. And even if it takes you a lifetime to go through the Qur'an once in that way, that's okay. The point isn't to finish the Qur'an, the point is whatever you study, you study it pr deeply. You know, effectively. Even if you spend a year on an ayah or a surah, that's okay. You know, study as many tafasir as you can, and, and study every single word in the ayah, and what has been said, and the reflections of other scholars about the ayah, but spend on it. Because Allah Azza wa mentions in the Qur'an, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَخْفَالُهَا Don't they reflect deeply on the Qur'an, or are the hearts locked up? In other words, this deep reflection on the Qur'an is a means to unlock hearts. It's a means to do that. So these are three levels of Qur'anic education that we need to uh, develop. Now I'm going to go on to other things. The imaniyat was the first thing. But then now I want to talk to you about what we need to be funding. There are certain uh, uh, issues in the ummah, living issues in the ummah today that are unresolved. They're unresolved. There are issues, for example, and I'll, I don't, uh, I'm not scared of, of controversy, so I'll come out and say it. What is jihad fi sabilillah? What does wala and bara mean? You know, our idea of the allegiance and separation. You know, Muslims living in non-Muslim societies. What is our status? Where do our allegiances stand? You know, these are not just things we should be asking ourselves, these are things non-Muslims are asking us now. <laughs> right? The non-Muslims are telling us, oh you're actually, you hate us because we're kufar, and you're trying to take over our country, and the only reason you're saying is Islam is peace, is because you have your covert agenda, and eventually you guys want to wage jihad against us. So all these mosques you're building are actually jihad training centers. They're saying these things to us, right? But actually we Muslims, let's be honest, if you ask 10 people in a row after Jum'ah, what is jihad fi sabilillah? You're gonna get one answer? You're gonna get 10 different answers. We ourselves are not in any kind of unanimity on what this subject is. What it, how it applies, how it doesn't apply. When is it being used properly? When is it being misused? We have no idea. 
And on top of that, it's e even more dangerous. You know that there are certain elements in the Ummah that are very militant. And they're very angry at the situation of the Muslims. So they write blogs and articles and papers about how we need to fight the enemy and this and that. And they'll praise ridiculous acts like the, you know, the, the, the underwear bomber. They'll say that guy's a mujahid fi sabilillah or whatever, right? There are Muslims on that plane, for God's sake. There are men, women and children on that plane. But they'll call it jihad fi sabilillah and they'll quote ayat and a hadith. And some stupid young Muslim teenager is going to read that blog and say, Man, this guy's got a lot of dalil for what he's saying. Look at all the ahadith and ayat he quoted. He must know what he's talking about. After all, all these ayat, they lead to one conclusion. Right? And when you say, well, what about this paper? What about all these evidences he's got? You take them to your local community and say, we condemn these acts. We have nothing to do with them. In other words, on the one hand, you have someone who's giving you all this evidence. On the other hand, there's someone who's saying, we are against it, but they don't give you any proof, evidence, scholarly discussion, nothing. One of the necessary needs of the ummah today is a scholarly, thorough understanding of controversial subjects. Not just so we can explain them to non-Muslims, for our own selves. For our own understanding, honest, deep, scholarly research. We need to actually, we can't expect it to happen, we need to fund that research. We need to identify the top scholars in a particular field and say, listen, your job for six months, produce a paper, then give a lecture, and then give us a series of khutbahs that we can give in our community so the Muslims understand this subject properly. And it's not just one subject like jihad fi sabilillah. It is, it is multiple subjects. You know, the education for Muslim women. The, the issue of what, how, you know, where do we draw the line for separation, things like that. The, the issues that are dividing us. Issues that are eating away at the fabric of our communities. To have proper scholarly deep research and actually have think tanks of scholars from different schools of thought coming to unanimous conclusions and saying this will benefit the ummah. Across the board, this is what we need to be doing. Our scholars have the credentials, but they haven't been given the direction. They have not been pushed. Our scholars will go and study for years, and they've studied amazing things. And yet, after all that knowledge where they are now able to do amazing research, what do we do? No, teach my children how to read Alif Ba at the Masjid. Which is important, but man, the guy studied 10 years. He's a PhD. It's like saying you did a PhD in mathematics, and now your job is to teach, you know, 1, 2, and 3, the, the, how to write the numbers 1, 2, and 3 in preschool. You know, we have, to, we, ha we, have to, we have these resources, we need to put them to work. You know, I'm not a scholar, but I tell you, I can claim to you that our scholars are not being utilized. They are not being utilized. And so the things they're being utilized for to me actually are pathetic things. And we need to, you know, first of all, we need to make use of what their training is for. And we need to expect more from them. So inshallah ta'ala, they give us what we need from them. You know, it's a mutual relationship. We don't take, you know, it's not all the scholars have said. It's not like that. Just tell us what to think about this. Give us answers for this, this and this. Profound research. And then the tradition of the ummah is when the scholar presents something, the people can ask, where did you get this from? How do we understand this? What about this? What about that? We, there's a questioning back and forth so we get to a more refined understanding. This is the role of the scholar, you know. So we have to bring our scholarship back in that sense. And we as a people have to demand it from them, as communities we have to demand it from them. So this is the second uh, 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 thing, beyond, beyond the, the study of Iman. Again, I'll, I'll go maybe 15 more minutes, inshallah. Okay, now I want to talk to you about something uh, that we cannot disconnect ourselves from. You know, the, the struggle of Islam, of course, is, an, is a timeless struggle. But at the same time, we are living in 2010. And we are living in a context where the Muslims have gone through quite a bit of change in the last hundred years. The last hundred, hundred and fifty years have been a very transformational time for the Ummah. We cannot separate ourselves from our history. Where, how we think, how we understand Islam, where we are today is a product of a lot of events that have taken place. And if we don't understand those events and what got us here, then we're not going to be able to understand how to move forward. So uh, very briefly, I'll just mention one thing. Islamic movements over the last 100 to 150 years. In 1924, the last remnant of, of what was an Islamic state falls. This is the Ottoman Empire, of course, right? The Uthmani state. It collapses in 1924. Since then, you have the birth of several movements all over the world, India, the Africas, you know, in the Arab world, that are trying to revive Islam. They're trying to bring Islam back. Right? And writers talked about how there need to be movements and groups that need to bring back. And this, this rhetoric started of developing an Islamic state. So pretty much every major movement 
in the last 100, 150 years talked about the revival of Khilafah bringing Khilafah back and quoting all the hadith that talk about the Khilafah and talk, looking at the Sila and saying look this is what the Messenger did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is what we need to do in other words tying their struggle directly to the Sira of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now in, in one sense that's very good in the sense that we need to tie our struggle always to the struggle of the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam but in one sense, sense this is oversimplification when we take lessons from the Sira we cannot ignore the time, the place, and the changes that have taken place. So you cannot copy-paste lessons, you have to apply them very carefully. This requires a lot of detailed understanding of the time and place in which you live. And so I want to present to you something that actually uh, uh, one of my, my very dear teachers and colleagues, uh, um, and uh, to me actually an intellectual role model who's a member of this community, Brother Bashir Ansari, uh, wrote uh, in Al Jazeera. He wrote an article in Al Jazeera al uh, Islamiyun Bayna Dawla Wala Dawla. I thought it was fantastic, really. I, I, I studied it with him when I took him with me to Detroit. And I thought it was just absolutely stunning, this article. And I hope to actually get it translated and, and make it available to you guys. And the, the, the subject of the article was Islamists, meaning Islamic movements, caught between having a state and not having a state. Right, this idea of statehood. In other words, two things became equation. Establishment of deen equals establishment of a state. This idea was made common. If you want to establish the deen, you have to have a government. You have to have a state. I don't mean New Jersey, I mean like a government state, okay? It lies in statehood. So, this idea is actually what he questions. And he says, what are the roots of this idea and what are the problems with this idea? First of all, most of the movements that called for a state have had no experience or idea or know-how how to run a state. What does it take to run a government? Sanitation, police, road maps, taxation, right? Huge bureaucracy. I mean, if you work in a big company with 500 employees plus, governments are the biggest kinds of organizations in existence. They're the, the most colossal organization with the most number of employees. It is a massive, massive bureaucracy. So you have a movement that says, we should have an Islamic State, we should have this and that and the other. But they don't have even close to the road map to what it takes to build a complex state. You cannot compare that to the, the life in Medina. Medina was simple, easy. These people didn't need governments and a water department and a taxation department and a you know, municipality. And they didn't need these things. They just had simple hut homes. And they were living in tribal lives. Now they're a little bit more organized. A very, it's a very preliminary form of a state that the Messenger established. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For that society was very advanced, but compared to what we have now, it's very simple. So to say, we're just going to go establish and say, if you give these movements, let's say, you know what, we're ready to give you the state, here. Here, take Pakistan. Take it. Take, take, you can have it. What are they going to do? How are they going to run it? Do they have the credentials to actually budget, to, to, to finance a budget? to engage in you know, policing and things like that? They don't, they don't have the wherewithal. These are things that require a high degree of expertise. And by the way, let me tell you something else that, was, that he mentioned in the article that to me was mind-blowing. A movement, when Muslims are trying to say Muslims need to wake up and we need to stand up and we need to establish the deen, these are the kinds of things I can give in a khutbah and people might say, Takbir! Right? Everybody's gonna, yeah! Yuqamu to deen! But, but, so movements can fire people up. They can, they, can, they can invigorate people, they can inspire people, people can read the works of people like Maududi rahimahullah or Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah and to this day be moved, right? And be like, you know, or Mulana Ilyas rahimahullah, these people, they can read them and say, wow, that's amazing stuff, you know? But, tell me which country in the world today looks at its government and say, they are so awesome. I love those guys in government. You know what comes with being in government? What naturally comes with being in government? Being hated. You can't avoid it. People have a natural tendency to not be inspired, especially not be inspired by their government. And some places in the world, these groups figured it out. I'll give you an example, not because I condone them, because we need to understand the political science of this. You have a group like Hezbollah. Now there's efforts made in, in Lebanon to enter them into politics, right? They want to bring them into the political realm. But the leadership of Hezbollah says, no thanks, we don't want government. You know why? Because when they're outside of government, a lot of people love them. <laughs> but if they enter government, what's going to happen? 
They're going to lose their credit. Oh, they're corrupt like all these other government politicians. You see what I'm saying? So they understand that they're more powerful outside government than they even are inside government. Now let's not just take a, a, an Arab example, let's take an American example. How much does government affect your life? On a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, I know you pay taxes every year. I understand that. But other than that, on a daily basis, what influence does government have on your life? The major things that are in this country, for example, the, the way you think about fashion, the way you think about what's success and failure, your mentality, you know it doesn't come from the government. It all comes from the private sector. It comes from the entertainment industry, and the academia, and the major corporations that are selling products to us, and running, driving the advertising, and, the, and the, all, even the medical research, and you know, all the research universities funded by private organizations. In other words, the vast majority of things that influence you on a day-to-day -day basis don't come from government. Where do they come from? Well, what I like to call the private sector. They come from the private sector. If Muslims understood that, you know what we would be worried about? If you really want to take over society, you know what you should be taking over? The private sector. Open field. The Muslims haven't even begun to touch the, how many Muslims in media. More powerful than government today is what? The media can change the, the course of elections. The media can get a president impeached. The media can do crazy things. The media can say things like horrible, terrible things like Obama's Muslim. Right? <laughs> and get away with it. Media is powerful. Academia, universities, universities shape the minds of the, 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 the pillars of this society. How many Muslims in academia? How many Muslim sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, historians? We're not present. We came to this country and we thought success is doctor, engineer, okay fine, you couldn't do doctor, engineer, programmer, right? Uh, you know, I, uh, IT, right? Or, okay, if none of those worked out, gas station, <laughs> right? So <laughs> this was success for us. If we make good money, if we can buy a nice house, if we can live in a nice neighborhood, we've got success. This is success for an individual, maybe. For a community, look at what, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, baffled by the Jewish community. I'm, I'm amazed by them. You know why? Because when they first came to this country, they were treated like we are treated now. And you know what they got themselves, you could say, oh, they're, they're riba people, whatever. But you know what they, what they really got themselves into? Not just financial institutions. Entertainment, literature, academics, virtually any major university in, in, in the country, a significant proportion of the faculty is Jewish. That's a norm. That's, it just, it's normal, you know. So they became the deep fabric of this country. So it's so much so that they're untouchable. Muslims didn't. We just become, we became skilled labor. That's all we are. Even if you're a doctor, even if you're an engineer, in the end, you're just a highly skilled worker. You're not, a, you're not someone who influences minds or, or causes ripples in society. You, you're not. You know, you're just, a, you're just a better consumer, so you buy a more expensive car, so I guess you're adding to the economy a little bit. But you're not a mover and shaker. You're not an influencer of minds. You understand? So Muslims, we have to understand to penetrate this society, we need to enter the private sector. To enter the private sector, we need to be in major positions in universities all over this country. We need to be actually funding. You know Islamic studies program at the University of Chicago is funded by a Jewish group? What do you think that they're gonna, what kind of research they're gonna produce? Which Islamic studies program at the PhD level is being funded by Muslim organizations? There's one attempt being made in, in Detroit with, the, with, with you know, um, uh, w w I think in, in Troy, Michigan. And they're asking for an endowment of a couple of million and the Muslims are struggling to come up with those money. I appreciate their effort actually. If you're not entering into the, this is the game. You gotta enter the game. You know the messenger challenges the poets. The poets of our time are the academics. You gotta enter the game. You know, we're not even in it, we're just, we're bubbled uh, by ourselves. So this is a very big thing that we need to enter. We need to have our Muslim youth that are creative, go into media studies, go into film production. This is the language of our, this is the poetry of our time. You know, the, the thing that moved the masses in the time of the messenger was poetry. What moves us today is YouTube, right? We need people that are actually qualified in film production, sociologists. Psy you know, not just psychologists, but, but even like historians, Muslim historians, we need them. 
We don't have them. We don't have, these are things that become the fabric of a society. And the other thing we need is huge, massive Walmart-sized businesses. Not just run by individuals, but they're these massive, massive organizations that are funding entire like projects. So for example, I'll give you a secular example like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from, you know, from Microsoft, right? They give so many endowments to schools across the country and help out and things like that. Muslims need to have institutions like that. That don't just help Muslim institutions, they help America in general. They help America at large. Why should we do this? Because then we become a fabric of this society. We become, they, they can't talk about us like they do now. They talk about us now as though we're like these uh, wild dogs let loose in the society. Literally, that's how we're talked about in the media. There's no, we're not given human dignity when we're talked about. That's not, that's not where we stand. Why not? Because we isolated ourselves. We, we, we did that to ourselves. I'll move along quickly, inshallah ta'ala. This is the last thing I'll share with you for today. Probably we'll have another session to finish this discussion. And just to, you know, again, these are, I know there's a lot of different things I talked about here. But again, I just want food for thought. I want us to just think about these things. And inshallah ta'ala, hopefully the purpose of a community is some people are good at some things, others are good at other things. We manage our resources and people get involved in projects that are trying to build one part of the solution, others another part of the solution. And it's all sinking and coming together cohesively. That's what we need, that's the point we need to get. How many human resource managers in our audience today? Any HR managers? Not one? We should have human resource managers. Because we, one thing we need at the level of Muslim community is human resource management. This is what the scholars need to be doing. This is what the, you know, the, the, the reverts who've come to Islam, this is the training they need so they become awesome da'is. This is what our, our, our kids that have finished hivs need to be doing. This is what the mothers of the community need to be doing. Uh, allocating projects to different you know, groups and helping them build this community from the ground up. So here's the last thing I want to share with you for, this, uh, for today and we'll have a little bit of a, a, a QA session. I want to talk to you about something I heard at the ISNA convention that, that struck a chord with me. And I thought it was, it was very powerful. It was presented by uh, Professor Ingrid Madsen. And she talked about the difference between a cult and a community. So this is the last thing I'm sharing with you. The difference between a cult and a community. A community is a place where everybody's welcome. And diversity is appreciated. The fact that you are different is a good thing. Because it adds to the texture and the depth and the richness of the community. A cult, however, demands that everybody be exactly the same. They should talk the same, they should dress the same, they should look the same, they should act the same. It's like this uniform thing. That's a cult. Now, in a community, when somebody makes a mistake, you know, Muslims, we make mistakes. Somebody makes, you know, falls into sin. Somebody veers off the path. What a community does is it nurtures them and says, look, we all make mistakes, let me help you. And they can bring you back. And they can support you until you're back on your feet again. In other words, the community travels together. And when somebody trips and falls, there are others who can pick you up and take you along. In a cult, when somebody makes a mistake, they're kicked out. Well, they're, they're not, there's no tolerance. You got out of line, you're done. You're finished. In a community, you have this idea that when you, you want to engage and help, help people understand themselves better by open conversation. You want to be able to ask questions without being afraid of uh, you know, criticism. So for example, one of you has the right to ask me a question that so, you know, other people might look at them, how could you ask that question? How dare you say that? No, actually you can ask a question, you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions and to get clarifications because a community supports the idea of open communication. There should be, no, nothing is taboo, we should be able to ask whatever we want to ask without being, without being afraid of being judged, right? In a cult, you're not allowed to ask questions. If you ask certain questions, how dare you? You should be ashamed of yourself. Why don't you become like everybody else, a robot? <laughs> right? So this idea of keeping uniformity. And finally, in a community, you have the urge to want to not only understand ourselves, but to understand our neighbors. So we'll go over to the church, we'll go over to the fire station, we'll go over to our neighbors and invite them over to us. And we'll say, tell us about your faith, we'll tell you about ours. You know? وَتَعَوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Cooperate with each other in good, good things and in taqwa. You can do that. You can even, even agree to certain things with them. You know? So th now, you, a community would like to reach out and to be, be known and to identify itself as someone who can serve others. A cult, however, 
hates outside communication. They want to be isolated, cut off from everybody else. And what the cult does to their members, it tells them don't listen to anybody else because they'll mess you up. The only way you'll stay safe is if you listen to us. We've got the right Islam. Everybody else is deviant and out, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put waswasa and mess up your aqidah and this and that. So don't listen to this speaker, don't go to that convention, don't go to that masjid, don't go here, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Because it'll all be, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get lost. We're trying to keep you safe. Right, so the cult tries to keep its members bubbled and outside the rest. And actually I said finally, but this is the most important one, so finally. A community, one of its fundamental functions is to help the family become stronger. So in a community, it trains you to become a better father, a better husband, a better wife, a better son, a better daughter, a better neighbor. It makes you develop better relationships. Right? That's what a community does. You know what a cult does? It cuts you off from your family. You have conflicts in the house, you have disagreements and arguments, you have the, the home turns into a battlefield. Why? Because you're trying to turn your family, your family doesn't agree with your cult, so the family became the enemy. And the cult will even come and say, your family is a fitna. You should, you know, they're, they're dunya, we're calling you the deen, so leave your family. You know, this is a cult. And the, the reason I make this distinction is, a lot of masjids in this, in this country are cults. A lot of masjids are cults. And what we need in this country is communities. But we need, we desperately need communities. We need to understand this difference and we need to help our masjids come out of a cult and eventually become a community. You know, and if we're, and sometimes we're in between, we're kind of in between somewhere. And we're hoping that all of our masajid, inshallah ta'ala, are healthy functioning communities. And they don't end up becoming cults. There's a very important distinction to make and an opportunity for us to move forward. Inshallah ta'ala, at this point I'll take written questions, uh, written questions only, right? Okay. Okay. For those who have limited Quranic language, what is the best service source for understanding the Quran besides attending halaqa and asking the ulama? Zakallah khair. Can you recommend any books or series of books to understand the Quran or translation deeper, with a deeper level in modern and simple English, especially for the youth? Most of us from Asian countries have been raised with a warning that tafsir translation uh, are only for ulama and scholars. What is your take on this? Please comment. Should Muslims compromise on the site of the Mosque of New York, so there will be goodwill in the USA for Muslims. Even our Prophet ﷺ compromised with the kuffars of Mecca sometimes for the better future of Muslims, and eventually victory, victory over the kuffar of Mecca. Uh, wouldn't a hundred million dollars be more productive for the Ummah to invest in a hundred different masjids across the US instead of so stiff and pushing ground zero masjid projects so hard? What is the encouraging negative media and turning uh, general masses against Muslims and creating lots of hatred, hate crimes in masjids all over the country? Okay. Really awesome questions, by the way. Okay, so as far as number one, Quranic studies, um, there are several resources available. Uh, in English, one of the things that we're trying to do in Bayina is to create an audio library of a study of the Quran. So if you don't know about it, now you do, inshallah. If you go to bayina.com, B A Y Y I N A H, bayina.com, if you click on podcasts, you'll see tafsir lectures uh, on the Quran. We're trying to, over the next 10 years, do a series on the entire Quran. That's at least for audio listening. Um, and it, it's a partnership between myself and, and Sheikh Abdul Nasir, uh, who used to be at Colleyville. And uh, actually he's leading Taraweeh this year also here. So he's doing just the Barak, I already finished Jalz Amma, and I'm going to start here at this masjid after uh, Ramadan again. Bithinlah, and all the recordings are put up for free, so you have access to them. Uh, the second resource, there are some very, very good books uh, uh, written in English on the Qur'an now. A lot better than what was out there before and a lot more contemporary language. Uh, the number one book I would recommend is Pondering Over the Qur'an. This is a translation of Tadabbur al-Qur'an from Urdu into English and it's excellent English. It's very, very good English and it's very impeccably written. It's, once again, it's called Pondering Over the Qur'an by Islahi. That's the name of the scholar. Uh, a, a good translation, even though I have a lot of disagreements with translation, but nonetheless, better than most that are out there, I would recommend Oxford University Press, uh, Abdul Halim. Abdul Halim put out a translation of the Qur'an and it's 
closer to the text than others, even though I have my share of criticisms of that translation as well. So you have those couple of resources. As far as um, uh, having a meaningful relationship with the Qur'an is concerned though, you, each one of you, I don't care if you became Muslim yesterday, or even Muslim your whole life, you have to convince yourself that you can and you will learn the Arabic of the Qur'an. You have to convince yourself of this. You, there's no way around it. There's no, this ummah has to know it. We are a multinational ummah that spans the entire globe and everywhere the Muslims went, we learned Arabic. It's not just an Arab thing, it's a Muslim thing. It's not limited to the Arabs. It's part of our identity. You know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said uh, that every nation has a flag and the flag of Islam is the Arabic language. Right? So this is our, this is our identity. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah said it's wajib on every Muslim to learn it as much as it's possible. بِقَدْرِ جَهْدِهِ As much as humanly possible. Uh, as far as the question of, you know, we're taught that uh, studying or the Qur'an is only for the ulama and scholars, there's a, an extreme. There are two extremes. I'd like to share both extremes with you. One extreme is I can read the Qur'an and figure it out myself. That's one extreme and it's false. The second extreme is the Qur'an is only for the scholars. It has nothing to do with me. If the scholar tells me something about it, well and good, I'm not going to engage in a study of the Qur'an. That's also false. The healthy, a healthy relationship with the Qur'an means you are studying the Qur'an, you are studying tafasir, you're studying an ayah, and when you don't understand something, or you want to make sure what you understood is correct, you go to the alim and you ask him. But you continue your own study. You continue to read the tafasir. The great works of the scholars were not written for scholars, they were written for people. Mufti Muhammad Shafi used to give radio lectures in Pakistan that were turned into the tafsir ma'arif al-Qur'an. It wasn't written for scholars, it was written for you and me. And now it's been translated into English to Ma'arif al-Qur'an, even though the English isn't all that good. But the idea is, these are written for us. So we need to study them. And of course, you'll read things you don't understand. That's when you put the scholars to work and you go to the Imam. You come to Imam Zayn and say, Imam, Imam Sahib, what about this ayah? I don't get this. What does this word mean? Or what is this doing here? You know, can you help me understand? And maybe our Imams don't know and they'll force them to do research and come back to you. So we're really, it, this is a healthy thing to do. And this is something we should be engaged in. We shouldn't be afraid of studying the Qur'an, but we should respect the scholarly tradition of it at the same time. Okay. Very less numbers of youth... Oh, uh, I didn't talk about the ground zero thing. Um, I, I, I guess I have my own opinions. I can't give you the official Islamic stance on it. But um, I think uh, this, more than anything else, the ground zero issue is an eye-opener for Muslims. They didn't come and attack it saying, we don't want a mosque here. That was the first thing they said, but they realized that sounds racist and that sounds prejudiced and you know, it's against freedom of religion, so we're not going to go that route. You know what they came and said? We don't know who this Imam guy is. We don't know what they get their money from. Right? They came with all these other questions. So we all know why they don't want it. They don't want it because it's a masjid. But now they're coming at those attacks from a bureaucratic or background check point of view. This is a great look in the mirror for us. You know why? Because now we know that when we run a masjid or any Islamic institution, our accounting better be crystal clear. And our background checks better be solid. If we're going to be in this country, we have to learn how to survive. And we cannot run our masajid the way a masjid is run in Hyderabad or in Lahore or in Cairo. It's not going to run like that. We have to have certified professional accountants. We have to have crystal clear accounting on the books. We have to have an open relationship with the IRS. We have to have open background checks. You know, and we have to have even a transparent relationship with the authorities. We should even, they should know who we are and we know who they are. So when somebody comes against us and says, what are you talking about man? The, 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 go ask the director of the FBI, he knows our imam. Go ask him. Because they, they, they know who we are and we know who they are, we have nothing to hide. Right? We, we can't be this secretive, blocked off, oh the kuffar are trying to get us. Well the kuffar live next door to you, okay? So, <laughs> they, you know, don't, we, we can't live like that. So this, this is an eye-opener for us. As far as the masjid itself, my opinion on it is, there are multiple roads we can take, only Allah knows which is successful. Uh, one of the roads we might be able to take is to take an, uh, t uh, um, put a moratorium on the construction of the building or the uh, establishment of the center and say because of the prejudice and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the racism that we have faced uh, we have decided that it's in the best interest of our community to take a moratorium on the masjid issue and we're going to you know, not pursue the project for another year uh, but at the same time we're hoping that you know, this is a chance for America to look in the mirror and ask itself does it really believe in freedom of religion? And, and, and civil rights, you know, and the right to, to, to happiness and things like that, and freedom of worship. So what that would do is it would actually create a discussion of shame on us. 
within half-witted or at least somewhat intellectual Americans, right? It would create that discussion, and it's good for us to create that discussion. At the same time, the Masjid project overall should be supported because America needs to know that we are here too, we are part of this country also, and we're not going to back down. We're not visitors here. This is as, if you're American, this is as much your land as it is anybody else's. And we have to take that, have to have that sense of ownership. And, and, I, and I say this because Muslims, we don't have a sense of ownership here. We don't. We all, we have this pipe dream, we're going back home. You know? And it is a pipe dream, you're not going back home. Well, you go for two weeks, you can't wait to come back. You put your flight earlier. Right? And some of them were like, ah, land of the kuffar, I'm leaving, I'm going to the land of the Muslims. And they went, and they came back after, yeah, I couldn't take it, man. I was, you know. And they're right back where they were. So get over it, this is your country. Get over it. Okay? And act like it. And you know, we have to, uh, on a side note, we have to stop acting like the, the people that are around us, or we're somehow not American. We are. Sorry. I know it might hurt your feelings, but we are. You know, it's so disgusting when Muslims can have a conversation and say, you know brother, I was talking to one of my American friends. What do you mean one of your American friends? <laughs> what he means is my non-Muslim friends. So in the mind of a Muslim, when you say American, it necessarily means what? Non-Muslim. That's disgusting. That's, America has nothing to do with being non-Muslim. You understand? And that, you know what that proves? You don't see yourself as part of this country. If you don't see yourself as part of this country, why in the world would they see you as part of this country? Why, why would they have a reason to see you as part of this country? So we have to change how we think. If we're gonna build these institutions and communities, this is not a tourist visit for the Ummah, we're here to stay. These masajid inshallah ta'ala will be here for centuries to come. This is only the beginning of our foundation. So we have to get that mentality out of our head. You know, this is our country. This is, these are our issues. You know, we're, we're not outsiders anymore. Now, uh, uh, um, very less number of youth might be opting for Islamic studies. We are losing large numbers in form of marriages outside Islam by youth. How can we control this? We can't control it. Um, the, the first thing is Islamic studies, in my opinion, you, you are free to disagree. I, I believe that a very, 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 very small minority of Muslim youth should be studying Islam full time. I believe the vast majority, if not all Muslim youth, should be studying Islam part-time and that should become a part of their life. This idea, I will study Islam one day when I'm free from all my obligations and I'll fly over to Syria or Jordan or Pakistan and then become an alim, get over it, that's not going to happen for you. But you should be studying Islam for, for your life. But a few of our youth, we do need ulama, but, but not everybody. And this idea that I want to go study at an institution so I can... You know, a lot of kids, man, I'm, I'm telling you this, I know this came up, it's not really our main topic, but I should say it. A lot of our young kids, it's no different than the rock star dream. It's no different. This young kid sitting in the audience, religious kid, he sees a khatib give an awesome khutbah, he says, I want to be like that guy. I can't wait to be flown first class to a conference and I can give a speech at the stage and everybody's going to say takbir. How do I do that? I should become an alim. I should become a scholar, I should go to this institution or that institution. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to be like that guy. Look, if you want to serve Islam, that's one thing. But if in your head there, there's this thing about, you know, we need more speakers. We don't need more speakers, we need more workers. And you can serve Islam without having to be from a certain institution. And I'm, for, I'll be honest with you, I have a problem with most institutions. <laughs> because the kind, very few respectable Islamic scholarly institutions in the world, for a good number of them, they are so influenced by the politics around them, and the ideological garbage around them, that they produce zombies, that they come back and they try to turn us into zombies. You know? They, they go there and they become these twisted weirdos. And then they come back and they, they teach that, you know, what happened to you, man? Why are you so weird? You know, so they, they go there and they become like strange. And I'm not going to single out any institutions. But there are some very powerful, reputable, scholarly institutions in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, in the indo pak in, you know, in the Africas. They are there, but a good number of them are just, they're just producing shameful results. It's just shameful. They're not adding to the solution, they're adding to the problem. But this idea of Muslims marrying outside of... Uh, the faith, is, that's not the problem, that's a symptom. The problem again is Iman. We haven't educated the community properly uh, or, or well enough. What is the best way to make this Islamic education affordable to all Muslims? Islamic schools are expensive, Islamic seminars are expensive, Islamic media is expensive. Awesome question. 
If the universities in America are not properly teaching Islamic studies for Muslims, then where should we pursue higher education of, Is of Islam in America? Okay, two very related questions. In, again, my opinion, Allah knows best. And this will be the last question we'll take, right? Or you have tons more? Um, you have tons more. Okay. So, uh, as far as Islamic education is concerned, I am a big believer in providing sustainable, affordable quality education. Now, how do you do those three things? Um, I know some of you will not like my comments here, but I have to be true to my convictions. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say with you what I'm convinced of, and we can have a healthy conversation with it afterwards. May Allah reward all the Islamic schools all over this country for the effort that they've tried to do, or they've tried to make. And I know that if you try to criticize an Islamic school, people who work for it and have poured their sweat and blood and tears into it are naturally going to be defensive. I, I myself used to be the principal of an Islamic school. But I, I do have to say some things, I'm just going to come out blunt and say them. Number one, the vast majority of our Islamic schools in America are a monumental financial fail failure. Number one. Number two, they're a monumental administrative failure. Number three, they're a monumental educational fail failure. In other words, the, if the idea was we're going to teach Islam and Arabic in addition to secular studies, the two things that are taught worst in Islamic schools, is Islam and Arabic. The, the least quality education is in Islamic studies and in Arabic. And if the idea was we're going to put our kids, and a lot of parents, let's be honest, a lot of parents put their kids in Islamic school not because they wanted Islam for their children, they just didn't want their boy having a girlfriend. That's, that's why they put him in Islamic school, because they saw that this kid's getting a little crazy, so put him in boot camp, in other words, the Islamic school, right? So it's more of a uh, a sort of a, a patching the hole kind of thing. So a lot of our parents who are bringing our children to Islamic school aren't even very religious themselves. But they're only bringing them because they think it's going to plug a hole. And the thing is, the culture of an Islamic school with very, very, very few exceptions. And in, inshallah, this masjid is an exception. Very few exceptions. The culture of the children in an Islamic school is no different than the culture of the children in public school, except that there's less interaction between boys and girls. But the things they have on their iPods, the things they're watching at home on a computer, the things they're doing on the weekends are identical to public school kids. That's pretty scary. You're, and, and then on top of this, this is again my opinion, you do not have to agree with this. But this is my sentiment. The vast majority of the funds of a community, some, uh, in a lot of places in America, go to the Islamic school. The masjid's built, and the majority of the funds are for the school. Yet the minority of the community, the small minority of the community is sending their children to Islamic school. So the majority of the funds are serving a minority of the population, right? Now the thing is, I don't say stop that, but I do say that the majority of the ki population also has children, and they all, they're also entitled to funds. It's just a matter, of, matter to me, it's a matter of social justice. Right? It's a matter of social justice. So what do I suggest? What I believe is, we need to have two things, like, and this will be my next, next week, I'll do it again. Is that okay? Can I do it again? Okay, next Sunday again. But this is what I'll talk to you guys about next week. After school programs, where our children get help with their homework, they get sports time, and they get some Islamic studies. For all the children of the community, the ones that go to public school, the ones that are homeschooled, all of them. Three hours, three or four days a week, they're here, they're getting good company, they're getting sports, they're getting better at their academics in school, they're getting Salat al-Asr in the masjid, they're getting some Qur'an exposure, their reading becomes solid, they start getting into halaqat of tafsir and other things, they're maturing as Muslims, they're developing friends that are Muslims around them, so they're building this culture of affinity with the masjid, and friendship around the masjid, and they're developing affinity for a role model that is Muslim. Very affordable, very sustainable, and inshallah ta'ala very powerful, that if we can do this. And we have the resources, it doesn't take money, to, you don't have to raise funds to do this. It's very easy to put together. That's the first. The second I spoke about last night at Plano Masjid is a revolutionizing Sunday schools. But we'll talk about that another time, inshallah ta'ala. But these are two things we can do. The other thing is, we are in the age of podcasts and, and digital media, so a lot of Islamic education can actually be recorded education. You know, the vast, great number of Muslims in Egypt studied the tafsir of Qur'an listening to, you know, Khawatir al-Sha'rawi rahimahullah. Why? Because they were broadcast on the radio or recorded tapes and things like that. It's okay, you can listen to these things and learn a lot too. For most of the time when you're sitting in a seminar, you're listening anyway. So we need to make free recordings available. And it's easy for us to do that with iTunes and podcasts and, and things like that. So that needs to be a culture within the Muslims. If, uh, and and the, the other thing is, um, I am actually a big fan of, I'm, I'm, I'm condoning, even though I think 
I have ideological differences here and there, but overall I think the fact that Zaytuna College is in, 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 in existence is a great success for Muslims. That the fact that we actually have an accredited college of our own. And inshallah many more to come. But this, th we need to build our own institutions of higher learning. And if we can't get there, then the next best thing, we need to fund institutions of higher learning in existing colleges. So we have the Department of Islamic Studies run by the Muslims, funded by the Muslims. We need to be doing that. So we create opportunities for our youth to study Islam at high levels in this country. If we don't build educational institutions, we have no future in this country. It's not going to happen. No, 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 we don't have this. Too many people. This is what we'll do, inshallah. So I got through half of my presentation, inshallah. The other things that I wanted to talk about, I'll just give you a, a, um, a synopsis of it. The, the next two things I'm going to talk about is a business plan for Masajid. Uh, you know, how do we create a sustainable business model for Masjid so they can uh, sustain themselves. Uh, an intelligent distribution of human resources, social sciences and Islamic studies, which is a very important topic. Uh, how we need Muslims, uh, you know, uh, therapists, uh, social workers, you know, uh, you know, marriage counselors, things like that. That needs to be an industry in and of itself because our homes are broken and we need people to talk to. So th this is a, this is an area that needs a lot of work. And finally, inshallah, we'll have a long conversation about engagement. Engagement means how do we present? How do we fight back against the wave of attack in the media? How do we effectively fight back? How do we engage so that our neighbors, for the for five square miles, everybody knows what this masjid stands for? And they respect it. How do we do that? That's engagement, inshallah ta'ala. So that we'll have that conversation bithinlah ta'ala next time. I, I pray that these uh, these this obscure collection of thoughts was of some benefit to you. And I pray that we as Muslims are able to think seriously about our own future and about moving our communities forward. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal give all of the efforts that are being made by the Muslims. He gives them strength. He gives them, you know, He fortifies them. You know, I, I, I hope none of you take my comments uh, incorrectly. I love Islamic schools, I do. But I don't think they're enough. I, I really don't think they're enough. And we have to be critical of, of our own efforts. If we're not critical of our own efforts, nobody's gonna be. And we're not critical of them in order to bash them. We're critical of them so we learn to, or constructively, so we make them better and they make us better. Because that's what the institutions are there for. We're there to make them better and they're there to make us better. So we improve our masajid, we improve our schools. We